Well, thank you both uh, very, very much for what I find an incredible pairing of talks. Um, it's a fascinating thing that you each obviously have served up a pretty rich diet of Old Testament texts, and you've given us an opportunity to think about central themes. You really focused a great deal on just the significance of relationships, and you really focused a lot on relationships, especially in relationships of power and the distributions of power and the complexities of that, mapping it in relationship to our world and especially to the challenges of globalization. What's fascinating to me about the two talks is that you, in some ways, uh, hit on very similar themes, but in really quite different ways. So I guess I just want to invite you to interact a little bit with each other. I'm just going to be an innocent bystander and uh, invite you to just reflect a bit. Uh, and let me ask Dr. Brueggemann if you would just go first and sort of interacting. We want to have a little bit of a conversation, and uh, I'll help facilitate that along the way. Well, it, it is an interesting question in the Old Testament, and, and you uh, you contrasted the the overt action of God in the Exodus and covert action uh, in uh, Esther, uh, and I uh, tried to make an emphasis on divine agency. Uh, would would you say that uh, that Mordecai's allusion to uh, God uh, it, would he, would he say God is an agent in uh, the international process? Do you think, or how how, uh, how would you uh, uh, think of agency uh, in the unfolding of the future of power? Or is the, is the notion of agency not very useful for that? Mm. I think Mordecai in this story is a man who sees the larger picture, a cosmological picture. Yeah. And absolutely, um, God is an agency, but in this case, I think he sees various, uh, it's a confluence of various actions. Yeah. In this sense, what I mean is, Mordecai sees that God requires human cooperation. Yeah. So, of course, God in his immense sovereignty, and I do think the sovereignty is present in the book of uh, Esther. Yeah. And I do not mean sovereignty to undermine everything and silence all the other voices, but I think it is an interesting way for us to see the interaction between God's sovereignty and human willpower. Yeah. And there we have, obviously, the juxtaposition of the perennial question, right? Yeah. Uh, divine providence, divine, the preordination of things, and yeah. where do I figure into that orchestration? Yeah. Therefore, I think in just that one statement of Mordecai, we have a lot to learn and continue the discussion on. Yeah. He, he, uh, Mordecai may see the cosmic picture but he says, this, this is the moment. Right now, you have to decide. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, that missional participation in the life of the world uh, has to do with the specificity of time and place. Uh, it, is, it is framed in the large picture, but, but he because he sees a large picture, he does not let the immediacy of this moment evaporate. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to be present at this moment around this issue. For Absolutely. such a time as this. That's such right. Time and I think this. that's very important and pertinent for yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> because we sometimes tend to think that we are just going along with the flow, but actually history is broken up into, it's bracketed up. That's and right. We are responsible, just like in that TED talk, yeah. we are responsible for what's happening with this generation because right. we have people coming behind us who will wonder, where were you? What did you do to bring change to that historical uh, event? Like they said and that the, will define, as cliche goes, our your, your grandchildren will ask you, where were you? That's right. Yeah. 
And when you when you when you try to spot a moment like that, uh, you know, uh, I was watching CNN some today, and there were people who were suggesting that this whole Baltimore thing is such a time as that. Yes. Uh, and you can you can miss such a time as that uh, if you don't have uh, uh, evangelical an antenna to spot the moment when when we are being called to uh, run risks. That's right. Yeah. And I would like to clarify that having that attitude for such a time as this and how we shall be viewed by history later does not mean that we all have to take the same role. Right. Precisely your question about agency. Yeah. I think the beauty is, despite the fact that we're all going through the same circumstance and historical situation, we have to take different roles. Yeah. Esther has her own role to take, and I'm sure her lifetime history led her up to that particular moment, just like Mordecai had to play his own role. And it does not even mean that we have to be agreeing on, our, on how we proceed yeah. to solve these issues. Yeah. Right? We do need to acknowledge the fact that God uses the plurality of voices, and we are agencies who have their own strategic way of doing things. Yeah. And that comes from God. Yeah. I was wondering in that way if, when you, Dr. Lee was talking about uh, Mordecai's response, whether that, how that tied in in your thinking to othering. How is othering tied into the seeing and acting of? such a time as this? Because it seems like that's what sets up either our willingness to engage or not engage yeah. in the moment that is this moment, right? I don't think the, the Book of Esther is not a very good script for othering, is it? No, but that's my, <laughs> that's my point. So that's what I'm trying to understand. How, yeah. how does, because there is othering involved. It's the absence of othering yeah. that's present in the Book of Esther. That's right. right. So Yeah, well, I, I, I guess if you have to squeeze it to get something, uh, what more to... <laughs> What Mordecai, which is not, I'm not the first person that's done that. Uh, 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 Mordecai was saying to Esther, you cannot just think of yourself. Right. You must think of the other Jews, at least that much mm -hmm. othering. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was being called out of what she may have perceived as a safe place for the sake of the others even though it's a very restricted otherness. Well, that's partly at least how I was interacting with what you were each saying, because it feels to me like that hiding is part of what we do when we fail to other, right? right. And in the moment in the text, the question is, are you actually going to come out for the sake of, of something larger and greater and different right. than yourself? And that's partly where the, the sense of who we are in the world and how the neighbor, in this case, either the tribal neighbor or the larger neighbor, is, uh, is tied into our own sense of call. That's right. right, that's right, yeah. I, I don't know a lot about the Persian period because when, when I got educated, we didn't know anything about the Persian period. But I have read. That was such a time as that. That was, that's right. <laughs> Very good. Well done. Uh, but but I, ha I have read uh, that, that the, 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 the monuments of the Persians that you, to which you alluded, were set up to, to create a sense of timelessness and the laws of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be changed. And, and Mordecai the Jew believes in timefulness that contradicts timelessness. And I think that's very... Jewish and very evangelically Christian, mm. uh, that the Persian power arrangements are subject to change, mm -hmm. but it depends on human agency mm -hmm. to change them. Yeah. Dr. Lee, do you want to make a response back to what Dr. Brueggemann was sharing in his talk? Dr. Lovertson, I'm here to learn tonight, so <laughs> I am just savoring the moment. <laughs> <laughs> then you can ask about something you'd like to learn. <laughs> I'm actually interested in hearing further about this agency concept that you presented to us tonight. Well, uh, I have to tell you that I, that I dwell on that because I am a liberal who, among, who lives among liberals, and uh, 
uh, uh, Christian liberals uh, are very embarrassed about the agency of God because it violates enlightenment reason. And that, that's probably not a, a big deal for, for evangelicals. Uh, but it is very strange in uh, the modern or postmodern technological world um, to entertain the thought about a God who can be the subject of active verbs in the public process. It's, 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 very, it's, it's very odd linguistic practice. Uh, and we do that with great chutzpah. Uh. And I think with uneasiness, if we think about it. You want to? Yeah, I, 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 my reaction is, um, you know, I actually discourage in my uh, class, even though I teach at a seminary, I discourage my students from just with liberality using God as subject. Yep. Um, because I do believe that uh, sometimes, I think in the evangelical circle or in the Christian circle, as you said tonight, we can cheapen. Yes, we can that, cheapen. that's right. And we, we can be glib about it. Right, and I think we need to be better speakers of that language that does not explicitly use God, especially a subject, yep. but we can critically articulate uh, the description and prescription of what is happening out there in the world so that the other party, who are not necessarily evangelical Christians, do end up persuaded and agreeing with us yep. in this constructive uh, yeah. conversation. Yeah, it, but it really does have to do with the hiddenness. Hiddenness, uh, which requires smartness as well. Yeah, that's right. Wisdom. Wisdom. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Jack Miles, as you know in his biography of God, uh, uh, describes the way in which God as an agent simply disappears in the late Old Testament. And he, he, would, he would cite the book of Esther uh, as a place where God really has no agency. And, and uh, I, I think the hiddenness is probably right, uh, but I also think that if we lose the language of the agency of God, uh, I think we're out of business. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a very tricky matter, and I, I suspect uh, it's, it's simply useful to see the many different ways in which this is brought to speech uh, in, in uh, the Old Testament and in the New Testament, yeah. I think biblical wisdom teaches us to discern the context, the place in which to say what. And sometimes even right. to be quiet. Right? Yes. And in that respect, I think um, what we can learn for this situation is we need to apply reason and faith in knowing when to use the God language, God's agency, yeah. and when to use the hidden language. Yeah. I actually do not believe that because God, uh, God is, quote unquote, hidden, means that he does not play a, as powerful a role as he plays in the Egyptian exodus. Yeah. The, because of this development on our tr uh, faith trajectory, sometimes we need God to show himself dividing up the sea right in front of our right. very eyes. Yeah. Other times there are moments when we just know that there is a director, choreographer behind the yeah. curtains. Yeah. I, th I think one can do a uh, sociology of language to say that the more uh, affluent one is, the less language of divine agency makes sense, and the, the more vulnerable one is, the more the language of divine agency is urgent. I learned this when the, uh, the Jesus seminar, you know, voted that Jesus never said anything apocalyptic because uh, it didn't suit Dominic Crossan. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I commented on that in the Atlanta paper. I got called about it and I said it. And, and uh, the next day, uh, our custodian had seen that in the paper and asked me about it. And I explained everything about the Jesus seminar. And he said, uh, if Jesus didn't say something up, up apocalyptic, he said, I am lost. 
he was, he was a vulnerable black guy. And that language really was important to his faith right. and his social circumstance. Right. So yeah, I think you're right. Wisdom is how to say what, when, and in what way. I mean, my hope and desire is for people who come to study, for instance, here at Fuller, will use that discernment in terms of taking that agency out to the broader world, not just being confined within the church, where obviously we are very comfortable using God that's as right, that's subject. Right. Yeah. But going to places like, let's say, where world leaders convene, and we can speak about this God without necessarily quoting from the Bible, yeah. without using language that we use on Sunday at yeah. the service, yet the message is effectively and intelligently conveyed. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm addressing. Yeah. There was a there was a cat that was going across the street in LA and hurt a dog and uh, dove into a pothole and listened and after a while only heard another cat and came out and it was a dog. And the cat said, you sounded like another cat. And the dog said, in this town, you gotta be bilingual. <laughs> so, <laughs> what you're really saying is we, we, have, to, we have to be bilingual. That's right. That? At least, at yeah. least bilingual. Yeah, more, We're in LA. More, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that uh, is at the backdrop of any conversation about justice in a world of suffering and pain is that God is so hidden that it seems as though there is no God, right? This is the, the question that is begged. And, uh, and part of what you were talking about, about othering and agency, has to do with the manifestation of God through embodied people who actually show up as evidence of the pathos of God for the sake of justice in the world. So how do we hold on to, on the one hand, an acknowledgement of, in humility, not I think in theological uh, skepticism and doubt, but in genuine, deep, intellectual and spiritual humility, acknowledge that God is not prescriptively under our thumb or exactly uh, nameable to us at all times and places, but truly present. And in response to that, God, we are meant to be the visible presence of God in these places of great suffering for such a time as this. So how does that, how does that tie together in light of the conversation you're just having about the hiddenness? Well, Baltimore I, doesn't need a hidden God, but it does need a hidden God, and it needs more than a hidden that's God. That's correct. It needs yep. God's people. To well, I don't, I don't know why this is a response, but, but, but one of the things I've thought about is that, that the, the Babylonian Empire tried to eliminate Yahweh and had reduced Yahweh to powerlessness. And if, if it is true that Second Isaiah breaks that silence, uh, it, it really is the case that Yahweh came back into play on the lips of the poet. So he had to say it that way, and clearly in Second Isaiah, uh, Yahweh has agency. Mm -hmm. uh, very much, he's gonna do a new exodus and he, he's gonna bring us out. Uh, so I think, obviously, human action is important, but human utterance mm -hmm. is also really important. And, of course, Martin Luther King did that so well. He, he really had the capacity to use agency language even in public places. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a, a, a startling achievement that he was able to do that that way. Uh, and and I, I don't quite know how we come to that. Yeah, I agree that um, those of us who do not use God as subject, as agency, enough, we need to do more of it. Yeah. Those of us who are thoughtlessly, constantly That's right. uh, enunciating his name, we need to pause for a moment and think about how can I be effective without making it cheap? Yeah. Because yeah. I think that would deliver. Yeah. See, I, I've been in the, in the history of Old Testament theology, the, the, uh, the so-called biblical theology movement around Van Rod uh, really uh, was discredited by uh, uh, tenured exegetes 
who said it doesn't make any sense to talk that way. You cannot talk about God acting. And we too, I think, we too easily accepted that and failed to recognize the social location of those teachers who found that talk embarrassing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, the same, it's the same deal. Yeah, actually, during uh, lunchtime, previous to lunchtime, uh, Dr. Brueggemann and I had a conversation, and we talked about my experience from last year. We are coming back from one of the very, one of the most secular places on earth, the UK, and going to Koreatown for lunch. And just across this table and behind me, there were people who were randomly talking about God in their life. And I found that experience to be so refreshing because I wasn't in a church. This was not meant to be a Christian group of people sharing a restaurant. But it was just a very organic and natural uh, happening where people were just talking about God without obviously any uh, self-censorship. It was just organic. And I thought that was reflective of God's own work because on the one hand, we lament so much about reason and embarrassment and all these factors that uh, sort of silence us from speaking the name of God. On the other hand, we come across the other side of the globe and people, average people, not pastors, not academics, uh, are speaking of God about being present in their life, in their family, in their job. Yeah. You've both given us a great invitation uh, tonight into the subject that we're going to continue to reflect on over the course of the weekend. Thank you very, very much for what you've shared.